It's the hour, so we will start our press conference with the Commission of Inquiry on the Syrian Arab Republic, the three independent commissioners, Professor Pinheiro, Professor Magali, and Professor Welchman, are here uh, to brief you on their latest report, which is now public. We will be sending you a press release shortly with a link to that report. It's their 27th report that will be presented to the Council on the 22nd of September, that's next uh, next week. And uh, with that, I will immediately turn over to Professor Pinheiro for opening remarks and then to you for your questions. Professor. Gracias, uh, Rolando. Bonjour, uh, good morning. I will uh, present a very short introduction to, to situate uh, um, our report that we are launching today. Uh, today, Syrians are facing increasing and intolerable hardship, leaving it away the ruins of this length conflict, almost 11 years. Millions are suffering and dying in displacement camps while resources are become scarcer and the dawn of fatigue are rising. Around 30 million people, more than half of the country's population have been displaced internally, some multiple times, or have fled the country to seek refu refuge elsewhere. Most of the displaced live in poverty, families are scattered across various displaced camps, barely able to see each other due to the financial costs associated with the travel. Meanwhile, humanitarian needs are mounting with around 14.6 million people are in frontline villages due to abhorrent living conditions, the IDP camps in the northwest parts of the country. The 800%, 800% rise in food price since 2020 further limited the ability of humanitarian agencies to meet the growing needs, as did the closure of Damascus airport after suspected Israeli strikes. Now, the last uh, a few minutes before coming here, uh, we receive uh, an information from our colleague, the UN resident uh, humanitarian coordinator in Syria, Ibrahim Riza, uh, about the ongoing cholera outbreak in Syria. This outbreak is also an indicator of severe shortages of water throughout Syria. Of course, the UN had been sounding alarm bells on this issue for some time, but the international community has a great difficulty to hear these alarm bells. The outbreak presents a serious threat, not only to people in Syria, but for the region. The UN in Syria calls on donor the countries for urgent additional funding to contain the outbreak and to prevent it from spreading. Though there was a significant reduction in the number of pro-government airstrikes during the period under review in the Northwest, hostilities escalated between January and the present in Northern Syria. August saw a significant escalation in hostilities. In the Northwest, for instance, in Idlib and Western Aleppo, mutual shelling between pro-government forces and armed opposition groups including HTS, continued, resulting in killing and injuring the score of civilians, including uh, children. The skirmish between Turkish-backed Syrian National Army and the Syrian Democratic Force in the Northeast have led to numerous civilian casualties as well. In northern Aleppo, incidents involved shelling and attacks using improvised explosive devices that caused damage and destruction of civilian homes, schools, mosques, medical facilities, and administrative buildings. We also see continued uh, operations by Israel, as well the United States and Turkey, in, in a, this protracted conflict. In addition, Russia is still actively supporting the Syrian government, particularly concerning air strikes that have killed civilians, and target food and water sources. Families living in frontline areas have borne the brunt of pro-government forces ground-to-ground -ground shelling in those areas. In the Northeast, I repeat, the security situation 
is worsening in all whole camp, where several deadly clashes between internal uh, security force and camp uh, residents. I must say that Syria cannot afford a return to large scale fighting, but that is where it may perhaps be heading. Uh, uh, many times during the last semester, and also reflected in this, uh, 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 in this uh, uh, report, uh, the continued occurrence of third parties airstrikes, however linked to activities and the interest of uh, neighboring states, does nothing to advance or protect the lives and rights of civilians. Let me now mention an issue that is also very much present in our meetings, uh, bilateral meetings and uh, webinars and conference, the situation of children in all hall and other camps in the Northeast are in a particularly concerning situation. They lack sufficient health care and education, and many are traumatized by the violence within those camps. Young boys, once they reach puberty, risk being transferred to military detention centers alongside adult alleged dash fighters, doomed to detention without legal resource. Uh, this event shed the plight of more than 10,000 suspected former Daesh fighters and other individuals allegedly affiliated with the group that have remained detained in the northeastern of Syria, for the most part incommunicado, as well as the ongoing risk of detaining such suspects in civilian areas. Foreign detainees, including Boys still have no legal recourse years after their initial detention. This despite the Convention of the Rights of the Child that almost uh, member states have ratified. But I think in these areas, the obligations of the Convention of the Rights of the Child uh, cannot be respected. More encouragingly, just to give a positive note, but a very modest positive note, Hundreds of Iraq children have been repatriated this year for detention camps in North East and Syria to Iraq. Finally, several European countries also repatriated women and children. Uh, now the, uh, the last uh, topic that I will deal in this very brief introduction is the situation of the missing and disappeared. Tens of thousands of Syrians remain forcibly disappear or missing to date. Family search for their loved ones in Syria, often undertaken by women, is fraught with danger of being arrested, extorted, and abused. In addition to being disproportionately affected by the consequence of enforced disappearance, women and girls have been subjected to gender abuse and violations of their rights, including freedom, of movement, expression, and association, housing, and property rights. And uh, the final happy ending for the moment, after the commission insisting that uh, the issue of the disappear, after 10 years of conflict was not being taken in consideration by member states involved in the conflict. Finally, we are, we are very happy that the General Assembly I had a resolution asking the, uh, the Secretary General to prepare a study of an entity, of a mechanism uh, to deal with uh, uh, the disappear and the missing. This is also the consequence of a very active uh, militancy activity by the families of, uh, of the Syrians. And then, as this last uh, note, we say that we welcome, we very much welcome the Secretary General's recent report where he calls for a new body to clarify the fate and whereabouts of the missing and disappear in Syria. It strongly affirms, as we wish it, what the families, the Commission, and many others have long advocated for. Now, Member States must seize the moment and make it a reality for the sake of the victims and their families. 
I think that the title of this uh, press release is an invitation for the international community to be generous, not only towards some kind of refugees, but for the Syrian people and the Syrian refugees. What we ask the international community is don't look away of the disasters that continue in Syria. And if you would like to know everything that we did about uh, the Syria's missing and disappear, we have uh, a policy paper. Is there a way forward? Everything is explained so that you can understand what the study of the Secretary General is. We'll be delighted to, to share with you any, uh, uh, any information that uh, we could have about the things that I said and about this issue of the missing and disappear. Merci. Thank so, you. Well, thank you, uh, Paolo, very much. And just uh, for your reference, see the policy paper, uh, serious missing and disappeared, is there a way forward? This is a paper from the commission, which is on, on their website. Um, so now we turn to you for your questions. Yes, Musa, in the room. Merci. Euh, je pars du titre de votre rapport. Vous, euh, donc vous, vous avez un avertissement que euh, l'escalade les, va peut-être revenir. Vous, donc vous avertissez qu'il euh, y aura peut-être de nouveau une escalade militaire. Euh, quels sont les éléments, ou bien, quels sont les éléments euh, que vous avez pour cet avertissement, pour arriver à ce résultat Merci. استاذ هاني بدك سؤال بالعربي؟ لا 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 n'a pas euh, arrivé n'est pas arrivé à cette conclusion simplement parce que c'est une observation on, euh, un calcul qu'on a qu'on a fait mais c'est véritablement euh, le résultat des situations concrètes d'escalade par exemple dans le, les trois régions qu'on a concentré notre analyse le nord-est le nord-ouest et dans le sud la question, je crois que la, la situation dans le nord-est, de nord c'est emblématique parce que là, vous, euh, il y a euh, toute une confluence des différents acteurs, de membres, euh, des États membres qui sont euh, présents dans les territoires, c'est-à-dire vous savez quels sont euh, ces pays qui ont, euh, qui ont de, de force ou de force qu'ils soutiennent dans cette région. Et il y a des contradictions très présentes. C'est-à-dire, nous, on a décidé d'appeler l'attention de la communauté internationale pour ce développement. Parce qu'à un certain moment, on avait l'idée que la, la guerre est finie, était finie en Syrie. Ça, c'est complètement loin de la réalité. Et donc, ce rapport, parmi d'autres questions, a, a pris très au sérieux l'observation de ces nouveaux développements dans le terrain du conflit. Maybe to just to add that, uh, you know, the report covers the last six months, January to, to July, and in the early part of that period, we, we were actually seeing and the level of violence had, had gone down and, and the picture was looking brighter than in the latter part of the, of the reporting period where we have seen an escalation in mutual selling and uh, there was a, a growing concern that, that Turkey, as it had declared, would be going back into Syria to deal, as it has always said, to deal with the risks to, to Turkey and or Turkey, I should be saying. Um, 
and increased use of drones in particular with uh, targeted killings of individuals, etc. And in the South, as Paolo was saying, we were seeing unrest, particularly in, in Dara and, uh, and violence. Uh, there was one incident in the South where there was an attack uh, near a checkpoint. Uh, and the response by pro-government forces was to shell uh, a town, Herak, near where that checkpoint was, and then and to go in and arrest people. And uh, those arrests have led to people being taken away, and their, their fate is unknown. Um, so we are seeing increasing violence now, and, uh, and that's very worrying. Thank you both. We now have a question from Laurent Sierra, a Swiss news agency. Go ahead, Laurent. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Rolando. Thank you for the press conference. Um, in the report, you mentioned uh, several cases of families who just learned uh, recently uh, that their relatives uh, was was dead, probably for, uh, has been dead for years, either in detention or or there is that case in uh, uh, Eastern Buta from the people that uh, fled uh, with the Russian corridors. Uh, is that the result of a new behavior from uh, some of the parties, or is that the result uh, of the pressure that was either put uh, through you or the, the efforts of the ICRC? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. You know, we're constantly trying to, you know, over the period the Commission has been active, trying to find out the fate of people who have been disappeared, missing, uh, you know, and hence, of course, the, we're very happy to see now a recommendation for an international entity to be established. But specifically in the last period, uh, we became aware, for example, uh, I think you were referring to Eastern Ruta, where the families were informed and, uh, and death certificates were issued for relatives that they knew had been involved in the ev evacuation from Eastern Ghouta in 2018. And now the when the families have been searching for these people and, and then the death certificates emerged from the registry office in, in Eastern Ghouta, uh, informing them that uh, their relatives were no longer alive. And in some cases, the dates of people who were no longer alive were on the same day, which suggests then the, there was an incident, perhaps they were executed on that day, as opposed to people who had died in different circumstances at different times. Um, so we, we, this is why we drew attention to it in, in the report. But gradually people are finding out sometimes through this means where the state is beginning to issue death certificates to families without any information about the circumstances. But then families are putting two and two together and, and figuring out from the dates they sometimes are around certain events or certain times that make them then reach conclusions. Thank you. Sir, yeah. okay. if you can identify yourself also just for the... Uh, Nabil Abisab Al Arabi TV station. Uh, so uh, I have uh, two questions, please. It seems that maybe the, the clashes or uh, the fighting on uh, cross uh, uh, on front lines is uh, quieter than before. But uh, we see in the report that uh, there is a lot of uh, looting, um, violence against uh, civilians within the government area or within the uh, opposition areas. Um, uh, seizing properties, etc. Can you please uh, give us some details on on these incidents? And two, uh, you know, your your uh, report is important for uh, uh, displaced people or refugees out of Syria. Maybe they can decide to return or not to return uh, upon your your uh, report. What's your message to these people? Uh, we see in the report that it's not safe for many of them to return, but is this the case for everyone, everywhere? What's your general assessment on that? Thank you. Something about your, uh, your second question. Uh, of course, uh, it, it would be impossible, and I think it would be irresponsible 
to tell that for all the territory of Syria, uh, it's, it's impossible for uh, Syrians to return. But to, for uh, the, the territories or the areas that we have examined, uh, the situation is not yet uh, safe. But of course, we have to take in consideration uh, the uh, the full territory of the country, and and uh, other people uh, have developed other analysis. But uh, in the areas that we were able uh, to to do investigation to research, uh, what we say is that uh, the situation is uh, far from be safe for returnees. Not only, that is not only the, uh, areas under government control, because there are other areas uh, uh, being uh, controlled by other armed groups that are not very friendly for these returns also. That, and this, uh, it, this is something that we repeat, that in the, in the terms, for instance, of the disappear and the missing, it's not only in the government uh, control areas, but also in other areas. As you know, Idlib is coordinated by a UN declare a terrorist organization. It's very bizarre that one governorate uh, is uh, being controlled by this organization. Then they are, they will be difficult for people. If they want to return there also. Thank you. Yes, I'll, I'll jump in. Maybe just to add to what Paolo is saying. You know, of course, we you know we can't look at every single part of the country, but. But generally, this is a country that's been through, you know, 11 now entering 12 years of conflict. Much of it is destroyed. Uh, you know, the state is fragmented. We're talking about you know, humanitarian crisis across the whole country. So when refugees are being asked abroad and UNHCR has done a number of surveys, you know, would you go back to Syria today? You know, mostly they're saying we want to go back. But maybe right now is not the time to go back. And, and there are a number of reasons. One of them, of course, the conflict. But another one is, you know, you want to go back and have some sense of security, you know, that you will have, uh, you know, a place to go back to and be able to access it. You know, your children can be put back in school, you know, those types of issues. If you have some issues with the state, you know, for example, you fear you're going to be conscripted and sent to the front lines if you go back, then you know, you'd be worried about going back. Um, and even in areas that are not under government control, it depends again where you came from, you may not want to go back to areas where you may not be welcome. So generally, I think the message is, uh, and I, I saw that um, uh, you know, the uh, commissioner the, for UNHCR, was in Syria recently, you know, the message is, you know, Syria may not be at the moment ripe for countries to be thinking we can send back Syrians in large numbers. Syrians who want to go back voluntarily, of course, that's their choice. Uh, but even there, I think they've said, you know, we would like we would like some assistance to help us go back and be able to set up uh, because we don't know what the situation may look like on the ground. In terms of looting, uh, I mean, the picture is quite dire across the country. And, and we're seeing, for example, where people have fled, their property is often confiscated by whoever's in charge, if it's in government-controlled areas by pro-government forces or, or government forces. Um, often, you know, uh, that means those who fled have lost their rights to, to the property. Sometimes the property is being used to make money because, again, that's become the war economy. So either it's sold or, or the crops are sold. Um, if people then try to go back, they face problems because they find other people are, are sitting on their property. We're finding, for example, a growth of, uh, of, go of, of people who are acting as go-betweens. You want to renew your, your civil documents, your identity card, your you're trying to register a birth or, or a death uh, and you want to get a certificate, there'll be somebody who will say, I can do this for you because I can go back into government controlled areas and I can get there, but it will cost you so many thousand dollars to do it. 
And often those people then disappear with the money and there's no uh, guarantee. So uh, that's the climate I think people are living in, that there's extortion, there's blackmail, all sorts of things. Thank you. And just to add briefly to that as well, there's often, because there are so many female headed households now, both inside and outside, and a lot of those issues about whether people can go back and whether they have the right documentation to be able to access humanitarian assistance and to access their property to accept, a lot of those are, those documentation is needed by, by, by women. And the gendered impact of the conflict long-term and ongoing is something that we're also now investigating in some depth and needs to be looked at in, um, well, across the board in all the areas inside the Syrian terrain, because it's not um, improving anywhere that we can see. Thank you. Thank you. I'll turn now to Lisa Schlein of Voice of America. Go ahead, Lisa. Yes, hi, 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 uh, Rolando, and nice to see uh, familiar faces. Uh, I have a couple of questions. First, if you would uh, affirm or confirm that uh, Syria indeed is still in a hot war and that this hot war is likely to continue for some time. And then I'd like to know whether uh, the uh, whether Russia has uh, uh, stopped doing as many airstrikes, bombings as it has done over many years. Uh, it whether it has transferred the bombing that it has been doing, carpet bombing, essentially targeting of civilians and demolishing civilian uh, areas uh, that it has done in Syria for so many years, whether it has transferred this playbook to okay. Ukraine. Thank you. But uh, thank you. I, I, I would just say that we happily we, we don't have to follow up the, the conflict in Ukraine. Then I think that would be rather difficult to to answer your question if uh, the uh, the uh, the presence of uh, Russia, by the way, invited by the Syrian government, uh, continues the same. That is in the report we. We give uh, uh, several examples that uh, perhaps were not affected by other activities that uh, uh, the Russian Federation is uh, assuming in in Ukraine. But uh, I that is I don't I don't know what Henny will say, but I <laughs> I don't think that uh, the the presence of uh, Russia in the uh, since uh, 2015 has been much affected because they have other things to do uh, in Ukraine. Thank you. Um, so on the question, uh, you know, you, you talked about is Syria still in a hot war? Um, and I, get, I guess you mean by that is the conflict still at the level it was if we go back a few years? And I, I think generally the conflict is not at that level because uh, as I think most of us know, the, the state is back in control of, you know, 70, 75 percent of the country. So the conflict, in a sense, is limited to the border areas between where the state is in control and uh, where it's trying to regain control of the rest of the territory. Um, you know, and hence we, as you can see in our reporting over the last, uh, let's say, two or three years, we've been looking at then other types of violations in areas controlled by by the state or by armed groups in control of other parts of, of the country. Um, as I said at uh, the beginning, you know, in, at, at the start of this six month period, I think we saw less of a conflict, you know, level type of violence, but we're seeing that I think increasing in the last, let's say three months. Uh, we're seeing, in, uh, particularly if you're talking about Russia, we've been seeing many, many more aerial bombardments in the uh, in the sort of Idlib region, let's say in the northwest. Uh, it's often difficult to identify whether, because all the planes pretty much are Russian planes, whether they're being flown by Russian pilots or by Syrian pilots. But we've certainly seen an, an increase, and in the report you'll see some incidents of 
of aerial uh, attacks where you know for example uh, you know a water uh, a water station was hit uh, you know um, uh, you know nearly a quarter of a million people depend on that on that station and uh, you know for for you know 20 30 days the, they didn't have access to water from that station there are other incidents where we've reported on aerial bombardments etc thank you so I just briefly also to show you another policy paper which we completed and we issued in June, the end of June 2022, so it's fairly up to date, called Civilians Under Attack in Syria Towards Preventing Further Civilian Harm, and this paper looks specifically at the conduct of hostilities and by the different parties, um, actors involved in different parts of Syrian terrain. So that's also available on our website. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, we'll turn back to the room for Body and then over to Nick of New York Times. Go ahead, Body. Thank you, Body Hooker for Nick's TV. I have a question. I'm, I'm back to, to your report. Uh, what I understood is the preceding reports would have made last year or or, or last years. Uh, you have been interviewed, you have interviewed old people out of the country. And what about the new one? And the uh, have you been invited uh, to access into the regime um, by request, for example? And that the report has been uh, approved by the regime or current government, Syrian government. Uh, what's their reactions? Thank you. So I think to, to be clear, we don't have access to Syria, Syrian territory, because we would need permission from Damascus to be able to enter. So what we do is we communicate with people inside. You know, I won't tell you how we do it, but we, there are various ways of doing it uh, to be able to interview them and get information. And then we try to talk to uh, people who have left Syria, wherever they reside, neighboring countries, or sometimes further afield when we think they have good useful information particularly in the in the mandate period and then we've had to double check everything we hear through other means satellite imagery uh, you know all sorts of other means to try and uh, be able to pinpoint exactly what we're hearing and you'll see in the report this is why we look at lots of incidents and then we try to focus on maybe two or three emblematic ones where we've managed to dig deep and be able to verify, you know, to the standard of the of the commission's investigations. Thank you. Thank you. And oh, did you want to add something, Linda? Yes, I, I'm not. I'm just following up. I think first or the last part of your question, which seemed to suggest whether we were, whether any government. Um, approve the report because yeah. we, we don't submit our reports for any government okay. approval. I have a follow up for you. Um, you just mentioned the incident, uh, what happened in the last months, or uh, you said it has been proved by the parties. What it means, parties is the which parties means, uh, the military parties, or I, I, I didn't get it. I'm sorry, was it was it this policy? Yep, yep, no, yep. it's not. This is this is um. This is, uh, it's not been, it's about the conduct of hostilities by all parties to the conflict. So it's not about us seeking approval for any of our reports from any government. We don't, uh, we don't seek, we don't pass these documents by any government or any entity before we issue them, apart from our team, of course. Uh, 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 just to uh, extra clarification, uh, that is, we don't ask, uh, uh, the, uh, the approval of, of any member state, but we speak with uh, a large spectrum of uh, uh, member states. Perhaps one of the accomplishments of uh, our 11-year work is that we don't take sides. We don't have uh, prefer member states. So, uh, that is, we do, and uh, of course we talk with uh, everybody, and uh, we adore to have criticism. But in terms of uh, uh, their approval, we don't care if they do, if they like or they don't like our report. It's not their business. Uh, that is why we have this adjective, independent. 
the uh, operative word being independent, well, operative words, uh, independent, objective, and neutral. This is uh, the commission's mandate. I should just point you to, while not divulging information on how they conduct investigation, there is a section in the report on methodology, just to give you a general view, and just to remind you that, of course, the Syrian government would have the chance to respond to this report during the interactive discussion on the 22nd, so it's Thursday next. Okay, over to Nick of the New York Times. Yeah, hello, thank you. Um, a couple of questions, please. Um, first, in relation to um, returnees who go missing, I, I wonder if you could just go a little bit more into that. Do you, is it your sense that this is a result of kind of systematic screening of returnees? I'm referring to people in the government areas systematic screening of those who are going back by security agencies, or this is more kind of ad hoc contact um, on, on any given day um, that sees people disappear. Uh, is it mainly males of military age? Is, it, is there a pattern here? Um, a second question relates to Al Hall. You mentioned that quite a lot of children have been repatriated recently. I wondered if there are uh, children of any particular nationality who have not received uh, the opportunity to get back into uh, their home countries, um, you know, there just hasn't been sufficient follow-up. And a third issue is, uh, I wonder if you could say um, a little bit about the number of Daesh, former Daesh fighters who are still detained. Uh, we, we don't have much clarity on the numbers. Um, and, are any of these going through any kind of judicial process or, or is it just a sort of blanket uh, detention? Thank you. Thank you, Nick. I'll just say something about your uh, second question. Uh, thanks to the diligent work of our team, uh, there is in the report um, distribution of uh, what nationalities the, uh, the kids have uh, returned. And you see that uh, very, interesting champions of the return that I will not uh, 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 say here, but it will be uh, curious to see what countries have more returned children. But we are, we are very happy, and I just said this, that uh, uh, several, for instance, several European uh, uh, countries after uh, initial refusal to get the kids and the, the mothers, now they have repatriated. And every progress in this direction we have to acknowledge what uh, we have said in the report and I have said it. But I invite you to look at the table. It's very interesting, the table. is in the annex uh, of the, the... Annex 7. Annex 7 of the report. Thank you. Uh, my colleagues... Uh, no, I'm just going to the annex 7. Okay. <laughs> okay, Nick. Um, so on the returnees and is there a pattern, you know, conscription, uh, you know, we've been looking very hard at this, and 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 we're we've been able to interview more and more people. I wouldn't say that there is a pattern. Uh, and remember, we're talking here. We're looking both at people returning from outside the country, but displaced inside the country who are feeling maybe it, uh, you know the climate is now improved. We can go back to where we fled uh, from another part of the country. Uh, we are seeing people who have gotten picked up and, uh, you know, for, for evading conscription and, and uh, either detained or immediately sent uh, to front lines. Uh, but we've seen people picked up for other reasons, um, you know, people who didn't think they were at risk, you know, had, had even signed, you know, reconciliation agreements and whatever, and, and then suddenly they go back and, and they get picked up. So the climate is still a little bit murky in terms of, you know, can you describe a pattern or are they looking specifically for certain types of individuals? People thought with the amnesty, for example, that, uh, you know, th that pressure of if you've been linked with security cases will have lifted. Um, again, we've seen cases where people thought that gave them some sort of immunity and then they got picked up. Um, on um, Dash in detention, did we answer that question or shall I answer? Dash in detention. So the, the numbers in the Northeast, there are about, I guess, 10 prisons, which have approximately 10,000 males um, um, 
from about 20 different nationalities uh, and probably about 1,000 what we would call children under, under the age of 18. Um, and, you know, we've argued quite strongly, of course, children should not be detained with adults, especially if you suspect the adults of being either uh, actual former fighters with with Daesh or have played the role one way or another with with uh, the Islamic State. Um, their situation is very uh, is very ambiguous. I mean, there's no legal process. Um, you know, some member states have asked uh, for a tribunal to be established there mm. and to try them. Uh, we ourselves are are actually not in favour of that um, because that opens up all sorts of other issues about uh, evidence and fair trial, etc. Um, you know, their their women and children are in the camps, as you know, in in a number of camps. The one I think the most famous one is Al Hol, and there we've called on member states to be, take back their nationals. Um, you know, there are large numbers of Iraqis, but there are you know significant numbers. I think in our whole, it's probably six, seven thousand coming again from a large number of different nationalities. Those in detention um, in the prisons, and they're about, as I said, about ten prisons. Again, the largest numbers are Iraqis and and Syrians, but there is a, there is a significant number, as I said, from from about twenty different nationalities. Thank you. It's just to follow up briefly on the. Um, on the annex, but to expand it a bit, perhaps annex seven in our report, page thirty-nine, um, gives it gives the the numbers, the sort of the, the range of numbers of children and of women who've been repatriated from the Al Hol and Raj camps and camps run by the SDF in the northeast of Syria, um, and it's 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 these are the ones that we know we've been able to to verify, if you like. What we don't have is what percent what what are the precise nationalities of other children who are still left there? So we can't say, for example, so we have the United Kingdom has repatriated between six and 15 children, but we don't know how many, how many more are, are left um, and other countries. You have a list showing who's, patriated, who's repatriated the most, but that's not a percentage of how many children of those nationalities are still in the camp. So just to just to be aware of that and also of, of the women there. We do consider, we've said this, not just in this report, the conditions of a whole camp in particular to can constitute cruel and inhuman treatment. The, the, the conditions there are appalling, um, both for children and for the elderly and women and other people who are held in those camps. Um, and it's an extremely situation, extremely serious situation that not only us, but also other UN special rapporteurs and officials have drawn attention to frequently over the past uh, few years and months. Good to know. Uh, I, I, I think that is important to, to say that, of course, the, the Kurdish administration, the SDF, has a direct responsibility in this situation. But they are not the only responsible. I, I think the member states that help to maintain these facilities, they have a shared responsibility for this situation. Because these same member states, they are very fond of accountability. But you, the, for all these children and for many of these this women detained, they, they are in this limbo that Honey is said, three or four years without any judicial definition uh, about uh, uh, their situation. Then I think that is very important uh, to know exactly what is happening there. As unhappily, we cannot, uh, we'll dream to go to our hall, but we can't. And uh, we know uh, by photos and videos, uh, uh, by uh, several serious publications, as the New York Times and Le Monde, that's appalling, appalling images. But this uh, has not moved to a change of uh, uh, approach for these terrible problems that these kids uh, maintain in prisons with adults. This is something that no democracy in the world can tolerate that, but we tolerate Member states tolerate that this situation continue in the in the north uh, in the northeast of Syria. Thank you all very much. Well, time time for just one last question from Lisa once again, the Voice of America. Lisa. 
<laughs> I don't know anymore. Yeah, uh, it's a follow up to a question that I already asked. And uh, I think M Ms. Welchman gave a sort of partial answer. I, I would like to have more of an elaboration on whether civilian areas are being deliberately targeted and attacked and whether these uh, attacks are increasing. And would you say that this rises to a level of a war crime? Thank you. So Lisa, just to, to you know, give you a sense of the way we try to investigate, you know, where we see incidents that have happened where civilians have been casualties, either injuries or deaths. We try to investigate those incidents to try to understand, you know, what happened uh exactly and then be able to define what type of crime has been committed and who the perpetrators may be um and for example you know when i was mentioning the aerial bombardments um you know we look at and try to understand you know was there a military target that you know was the objective um you know if not then we we, you know, we might say well was it indiscriminate uh, or was was it civilians who were being targeted? And there again, you have to then come up with the uh, with the information to say uh, if you want to be saying you know they deliberately targeted in uh, civilians, then you have to be able to come to that conclusion on the basis of evidence you've been able to gather. Uh, and you know it gets quite difficult sometimes to be able to get to the intent behind. So often we're 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 seeing a, a situation where we're saying, well, if you are, for example, using indiscriminate weapons in an area that's heavily populated, then of course you you know you must have known civilians will then perish, and and therefore you know we're closer to saying, you know, although it's indiscriminate, you you know there's an intention and you're targeting civilians here. Um, it gets of course complicated if there's a military objective in the middle of all of that. So the, the cases you will see highlighted in the report, we try at the end to, to reach conclusions, whether we think that these were deliberate, whether these were indiscriminate, based on the evidence that we've gathered. And, and we've come across, you know, you'll see in the report, we've covered most of these types of cases. We've come also across cases where we think, uh, you know, there may not have been an intention, but not enough care was taken uh, to avoid civilian casualties. Um, so we, we, you know, we cross the gamut, so to speak, but it depends on the individual incident, you know, what the conclusion we may reach will be. Thank you. Thank you. If um, no further comments from the panel here, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us. And of course, to the commissioners who, OK, Moussa, on the, the dernière question, s'il vous plaît. Merci. Euh, juste une question sur le raid israélien ces derniers temps euh, aux aéroports d'Alep et euh, Damas. Tadat an al-gharat l'israélien à la Mataray Halab ou à Dimashq. Yani, mararatum mirur al-kiram fi l'press release an had al-amr. Hala dekum ma'loumat ou mawqif min had al-amr. Shukran. Euh, je peux dire en français ou bien c'est... Oui, alors c'est ma question concernant les raids israéliens sur euh, les deux aéroports d'Alep et euh, Damas ces derniers temps. Euh, sur le rapport, bien sûr, le press release qu'on a reçu, euh, on passe euh, rapidement sur cette, avec une phrase sur, euh, sur ces événements. Pourtant, il y a, il y a eu beaucoup de raids euh, ces derniers temps, ces dernières semaines, les derniers mois euh, en Syrie. J'aimerais bien savoir votre position et euh, est-ce que vous avez des informations sur le résultat de ces raids Merci. Perhaps I'll start to answer that one, if I may. Um, we have 
been aware of some 14 Israeli airstrikes in Syria terrain between January and June, and then some more in August, which is not in the remit of this report, but of course we are still investigating. And the ones on Aleppo and Damascus, we could not, we haven't been able to so far corroborate um, any civilian casualties in those ones. Civilian casualties is what we investigate when these kind of strikes take case, and that's still under investigation. Um, on the 10th of June, the strike on Damascus airport, as we did say, I think, in the report, it did lead to considerable damage to infrastructure and to the closure of the airport for nearly two weeks, for 13 days, which also then meant the suspension of all UN humanitarian air force uh, deliveries of humanitarian assistance, which is extremely serious. And as Paula said in the very beginning, the continued involvement of third party um, military activity in, in Syrian airspace or indeed on the ground is, is, is not conducive in any way to advancing the protection of civilians in whichever part of Syria um, they take place. Thank you. Uh, no, it's not about this topic, but uh, perhaps not to lose this opportunity to, to clarify something about uh, the, the mechanism or the entity about uh, perhaps our friends that are who are not in the room, but perhaps uh, will be uh, listening to us. Um, since the beginning of this, uh, our contribution, our contribution to discuss about an entity concerning the missing and disappear, we stated very clearly to the member states, this must be done in a humanitarian track. This uh, entity, uh, this mechanism cannot be a trick to reach criminal accountability in disguise. No, because if uh, this will not be uh, considered in a humanitarian approach, we will not reach uh, uh, any aim that we, that is the aim is to provide uh, to the families uh, the, uh, the some information, some concrete information about uh, the situation of their loved ones. And uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, in this conflict, member states are arriving too late about this issue. In my own continent, in similar situations, we have uh, arrived to the consideration of the disappear of missing, not waiting 10 years to do that. And then I think I, we, that is the reason we much welcome the report of the Secretary General and uh, we expect that the member states that will support perhaps with a, a resolution, who knows, uh, in the General Assembly, that this aspect, and the, in our last bilateral meetings, we are repeating this. This mechanism will be placed and will be situated in a humanitarian approach, uh, not uh, as a, a disguise to, to reach uh, criminal responsibility about the war crimes, and uh, the humanitarian uh, law uh, breaches and all that. Uh, I'd like to, to end with this clarifying message. I'd like to just add to, to Paolo's message, and I'm glad he brought this up at the end, because really the focus on Syria has tended to be, of course, on the, on the violations of humanitarian law, the war crimes, the human rights violations, etc. But this is a story that really needs to be covered by the media. This is a story of the families of the tens of thousands of disappeared who have worked very hard, have come together, have formed a coalition, have studied the situation and have come to the international community to say, we need help. After 11 years of conflict, we have, they think the numbers are maybe over 100,000. Um, you know, we've been saying tens of thousands, you, you know, as we try to also get an understanding of the situation. But essentially, they are saying we need the help of the international community to resolve this issue. Um, they went to the General Assembly asking for help. The General Assembly asked the Secretary General to study the situation and come back with recommendations. That's the report Paolo is referring to. And the recommendations are very clear. He's saying there's good work that's being done, but we need to build on it. And there needs to be an international body, entity, mechanism, whatever term people want to use, to be established on this particular issue, both to help 
uh, find what's happened to the missing and the, dis and the disappeared, but also to help the families right now who are facing many hardships, looking for their relatives, being prone to, as I mentioned earlier, go-betweens who are taking money from them, risking their lives. Sometimes they may be detained when they're asking the wrong questions in the wrong place, etc. So really now the, the, the report is out. You know, what the, what the families are saying to the member states is, for once you've heard us and you've come out now with something, what will you do next? We need this entity to be established soon. As Paolo says, you know, this is 11 years into the conflict. So in some cases, it's already too late to be doing good work, but it needs to be moved on right now. And those who want to cover the story, the, you know, we can link you up with the families. You know, you can hear the stories directly. Um, uh, you know, they're the best advocates for this. Um, you know, we've we've taken it on board because we we see this as a very important issue. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you very much. It's a it's a good note to end on. An appeal to the international community, to you members of the press, for your continued support in highlighting this most important story. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to the commissioners. They'll be presenting the reports next Thursday. Uh, and we'll see you there. Thanks very much.